Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the glass spine. The first description of a glass spine similar to this one was made in 1907 in the British Medical Journal by Arthur Barker, who was Professor of Surgery at University College Hospital in London. This one has been in the Nuffield Department of Anaesthetics here uh, since the early 1950s, where several photographs of it appeared in Professor McIntosh's famous uh, monograph, Lumbar Puncture and Spinal Analgesia. It's essentially a glass tube, curved in the same way as the vertebral column and therefore the dural sac and subarachnoid space, with a small cervical convexity anteriorly, a larger thoracic concavity anteriorly, another small lumbar convexity anteriorly, and the dural sac ends here at S2. The glass spine has a rubber injection port here in the mid-lumbar region, and this rather curious structure at the head end is an expansion chamber. The reason for this is that glass, unlike the dural sac, is completely rigid, and it would be impossible to even inject one or two mils of solution into the glass spine without there being some way for this fluid to escape from it. There are other ways in which the glass spine differs from the um, dural sac. Uh, in particular, there is no uh, spinal cord and no nerve roots in the glass spine. The glass spine is filled with normal saline, uh, which has got a density very similar to that of cerebrospinal fluid. I think it's appropriate here to talk about uh, specific gravity um, and baricity. Much confusion has arisen over the years by using the term specific gravity to describe fluids injected into the subarachnoid space. Uh, specific gravity is a term which requires uh, that the temperature um, of both the injected solution and the liquid into which it's being injected are defined. Baricity is a much more useful term because uh, baricity refers to the density of the solution used compared with that of cerebrospinal fluid at body temperature. And the term hyperbaric is used for a solution which is more dense or heavier than cerebrospinal fluid, isobaric for a fluid which has got the same density as cerebrospinal fluid, and hypobaric if it is lighter. For the first part of the demonstration, I'm going to inject a solution made hyperbaric with dextrose and stained with waxylene rhodamine. And on this occasion, the patient is lying on her side. As I inject the solution, it cuts across the subarachnoid space and therefore the nerves of the cauda equina, and it moves a little upwards and downwards keflad and cordad in the subarachnoid space. We finish the injection, take the needle out, and turn the patient onto her back. And the heavy solution runs in both directions, cordad and keflad, in the subarachnoid space. What runs cordad is achieving nothing further in the way of a nerve block because the corda equina has been cut off. It is the solution which runs in the keflad end, which is of interest. It runs very quickly, and I've only taken about 12 seconds since I injected the solution, and it is already slowing down and indeed stopping uh, in the what would uh, represent the mid-thoracic region. Even if the patient is tipped head down, and this would be quite a steep head down tilt on a bed or table, the solution will only run another segment or two before it begins to slow down again. If on the other hand, and there is enough dye to show this, after the injection the patient had been left on her side, but even a little bit head down, there is nothing to stop the solution running higher into the upper thoracic, cervical, and in even indeed even the intracranial subarachnoid space.
For the next part of the demonstration, I'm going to inject a hyperbaric solution with a patient in the sitting position. And if you can inject very slowly, which sometimes is difficult, the local anesthetic may just trickle down into the lowest sacral segments in the cord equina. And this gives what you, what is known as a saddle block spinal. More commonly and perhaps more usefully, if you inject just slightly quicker, the local anesthetic goes straight across the cord equina and cuts the nerves off from that level downwards, uh, which would be about L2 or thereabouts. But the local anesthetic moves very little up in the subarachnoid space, perhaps a segment or two. For this next part of the demonstration, I'm going to inject a hyperbaric solution with the patient sitting up and then lying them down. This is a, a popular method of anesthetizing patients, even for quite high operations uh, in the abdomen. So once again, as we inject the solution, it cuts across the nerve roots in the cord equina. And at this point, most of it goes downwards in the subarachnoid space. So we finish the injection, and then take the needle out and turn the patient onto her back. This would be wedged, of course, if it was a cesarean section. And once again, the local anesthetic runs both ways in the subarachnoid space. I think it's worth noticing that the dye in the caudal end of the sac here is quite intense, and this is because an unpredictably high proportion of the local anesthetic gets trapped in the caudad part of the, of the lumbar convexity. But in the thoracic end, it once again runs down to the lower part of the thoracic concavity. But in this case, it is just possible that the spread uh, of dye, can, you can see, is less intense. So although the block goes high enough, it may be uh, a rather in less intense block uh, and may last less time. This time I'm going to inject an isobaric solution, which on this occasion is stained with methylene blue, with the patient again lying down and then turned onto her back. So as we start the injection, cuts across the cordo equina again, but being an isobaric solution, it doesn't favor the dependent side. Moves upwards and downwards slightly, keflad and cordad in the subarachnoid space. Take the needle out, turn the patient onto her back, and this time the dye makes no effort to run either down into the caudal or the keflad end of the subarachnoid space. From a nerve blocking point of view, the lack of dye and therefore local anesthetic in the caudal end of the sac doesn't matter because as usual the local anesthetic has cut across the cauda equina. This sort of block is good for operations um, in the region of the, the hip and the lower abdomen uh, because it's very easy to, to block up to about L1 or T12 but it can be very difficult to get these blocks to go higher. The reason for that is that not having gravity affecting these isobaric solutions, they are affected um, more, but unpredictably, uh, by other factors over which we've got very little control. The most obvious one, perhaps, is temperature. These solutions, after injection, warm up to body temperature and may become marginally hypobaric. And in these circumstances, if the patient is sat up, they may rise in the subarachnoid space. Other factors which uh, may affect the, the spread of these isobaric solutions are internal barbitage, as the, the nerve roots in the subarachnoid space uh, stir the local anesthetic up, and certainly in obstetric patients, 
uh, aortocaval occlusion causing congestion, congestion of the epidural veins may squeeze the dural sac and make the block go higher. Other unpredictable factors might be coughing and straining and because of that these solutions occasionally go disconcertingly and unexpectedly high. We put the patient back on the side again and the solution makes no effort to move, it just hangs there. It's now possible to demonstrate the effect of barbitage. This was used more in former years to try and increase the spread of solution. And this in involved aspirating the cerebrospinal fluid after the injection and injecting again. And you can see that it has some small effect in stirring the, the dye up. This is not considered a useful technique in um, modern times uh, because spinal needles nowadays are such small needles that there is very little um, reliable effect of barbitage. But spinal needles many years ago were very large and barbitage was often included as part of the technique. Now several minutes later, whichever position the spine is put in, the dye just hangs there and makes little effort to move. For the final bit of this demonstration, I would like to use the glass spine to show a problem which may arise when local anaesthetic solutions are injected through a catheter into the subarachnoid space. But first, a, a few words of explanation. In the late 1980s and beginning of 1990s, there was a flurry of enthusiasm for using continuous spinal anesthesia. And to this end, a number of manufacturers, so that the incidence of headache could be reduced by using smaller needles, produced small subarachnoid catheters. Most of these were 28 gauge, which would go through a 22 or 23 gauge spinal needle, but one was a 32 gauge microspinal catheter, which would go through a 26 gauge needle. But before these catheters had been in use for very long, several cases of Cauda Equina syndrome were reported to the FDA in America, that's the Food and Drug Administration. And I'm going to show you what may happen. I have here a 28 gauge caster and I'm going to use a one mil syringe for the injection because you need that sort of pressure to get the local anaesthetic solution down the caster. It was customary in these cases, unlike most spinal cases when using a hyperbaric solution, to lay the patient in the supine position before the injection. As you remember from earlier in the demonstration, usually except for a saddle block spinal, the patient is either lying in the lateral position and turned into the supine position or sitting up and then laying down. But with these continuous spinal catheters, the tendency was to position the patient in the supine position and then start the injection. So in this case, I've got this 28 gauge caster and you will see the hyperbaric solution traveling down the tube and then appearing at the tip of the caster, which is passed cordially in the subarachnoid space. And the dye, in other words, the local anesthetic solution, trickles down very much in the way of a saddle block spinal to affect only the lowest sacral segments of the spinal cord. And as we continue the injection, a higher and higher concentration of dye appears in the sacral segments, but still no block appearing higher than the tip of the caster, which in this case would be in the L3, L4 region, and therefore this would be quite useless even for an operation as low as the, the groin uh, for, a, say, a saphenous vein or an inguinal hernia operation. And still none of the local anaesthetic has spread over the apex of the lumbar curve. The tendency then was to inject more solution. And I've got another syringe here, 
and I'm going to inject more dye, more local anaesthetic, and it follows the same track down into the cold end of the sac. And this is typically what happened in these cases, that a larger amount of local anaesthetic was injected than would usually have been given by a single shot injection. And now at long last, the dye is beginning to spill over the curve and would have produced a block which would have been high enough for a, an operation in the sort of lower abdominal region. But the expense of a very high concentration of dye and therefore local anaesthetic and dextrose, which would be hypertonic, in the caudal end of the dural sac. And it was thought that this was the cause of the nerve damage uh, that these uh, high concentrations of local anaesthetic and possibly dextrose were neurotoxic. Because of this, the FDA uh, removed all small bore catheters from the market uh, and the situation nearly uh, four years later remains the same in the United States. But this ban does not apply in, in all countries of the world, although some countries did follow the, the lead of the United States of America. Anesthesiologists investigating the cause of the Cauda Aquina syndrome made various recommendations, including uh, repositioning the patient if the desired effect was not obtained with a, a reasonable dose of local anaesthetic, stopping at a maximum, and an alternative was perhaps to change the bristi. And I've got once again the isobaric solution here, and I will inject this, and we'll see the difference in effect between that and the hyperbaric solution. Starting the injection, you just see the blue dye beginning to come down the tube, running into the subarachnoid space again. But you can already see that it's not heading so briskly and so fast down into the lowest sacral segments. So we continue the injection again, like isobaric solutions. Under other circumstances, the block does not spread very far. It's not affected by gravity. And while it's making quite a high concentration around the tip of the catheter, this does not run down into the lower sacral segments. So it would seem in any case that it's probably more sensible and safer to use either isobaric solutions for continuous spinal anesthesia. Even now, lowest sacral segments, with no dye present there at all, therefore no local anesthetic, no high concentration of dextrose. In concluding this demonstration, I should say that although it is nearly 100 years since Professor Arthur Barker first described his glass spine model, you have seen that it remains a uniquely visual method of indicating the fate of solutions of various bristes injected into the subarachnoid space with patients in various positions.